Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Mobile World Congress 2017. Brought to you by Intel. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Palo Alto for the Cube special coverage of Mobile World Congress 2017. We're in our new 4,500 square foot studio, just moved in, we'll be expanding. You'll see a lot more in-studio coverage from the Cube as well as our normal going out to the events and extracting the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, and joining me with Jeff Frick, uh, general manager of theCUBE, but to break down all the action. As you know, we do a lot of data science. We've been watching the grid. We've been on the treadmill all weekend, all last week, you know, digging into the Mobile World Congress, sentiment, the vibe, the direction, and trying to synthesize all the action and really kind of bring it all together for everyone here. And of course, we're doing it in Palo Alto. We're going to bring folks in from Silicon Valley that could not have made the trek to Barcelona. We're going to be talking to folks on the phone, uh, who are in Barcelona, you heard from Lynn Kahn from Intel. We have Floyd coming up next, uh, CTO at SAP. He's going to be breaking down all the action from their new cloud and big Apple news. SAP now has a general availability of the iOS native development kit, which should change the game for SAP. There is tons of smart cities, smart stadiums, you know, IOT, autonomous vehicles, so much going on at Mobile World Congress. We're going to break that down every day, starting at, at 8 a.m. in studio. And of course, want to thank Intel for headlining our sponsorship and allowing us to create this great content with some contributing support from SAP Cloud. So I want to give a shout out, a big shout out to Intel. Check out their booth, check out their coverage, and check out the new SAP Cloud that's been renamed from HANA Cloud to SAP Cloud. So without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring this wall-to-wall -wall great commentary. Jeff, so uh, with that aside, we got two days. We got Laura Cooney coming in, Bob Stefanski managing this bridge between Detroit and, and, and Silicon Valley and all that great stuff. Phones are ringing off the hook here uh, in the studio. Uh, go tweet Tweet us, by the way, at theCUBE or at Furrier. Um, we have um, Guy Churchwood coming in. We have great content all week. We got entrepreneurs coming in. Tom Joyce, a CUBE alumni, who's uh, an executive, uh, interviewing for a bunch of CEO positions. Really going to break down the, the, the changing aspect of Mobile World Congress. It's the iPhone's 10 years old. We're seeing now a new step function of disruption. Peter Burris, head of research at Wikibon, said the most turbulent time and I even compounded it worse by saying, and the phones are getting faster. <laughs> so it's beyond the device. I mean, what, what are you seeing on the grid? And the, you look at the data out there. John, a bunch of things as, as we've been watching kind of the stream of the data that, that, that came in and surprised me. First off, just a lot of uh, early announcements around BlackBerry and Nokia, who are often not really mentioned as the <laughs> leaders in the handset space. Not a place that we cover real extensively, but really kind of these guys making a, making a move and really trying to take advantage of the void that Samsung left with some of the note, the note issues. But what I thought was even more interesting is, is on our hashtag uh, monitoring tools, that IoT and 5G are actually a above any of the handset manufacturers. So it really supports a hypothesis that we have that while handsets will be better and there'll be more data enabled by 5G, what 5G is really all about is, is, is an IoT enabler and really another huge step in the direction of connected devices, autonomous vehicles. You've talked about it, we cover um, IoT a lot, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, the robo car is also in there. That's a hash and tag. Well, everybody loves future, the cars, right? Future, well, it's kind of a symbol of the future of the car, which again, ties it all together. Right, right. Well, it's the, yeah, the driverless race car, <laughs> uh, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> Esports to a whole nother level. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was interesting. Another little thing as we watch these digital assistants and these voice assistants, John, and I got a couple for Christmas just so I could try them out, is that Motorola announced that they're going to partner with Alexa and use the, the Alexa, um, voice system inside of their phones. You know, I'm still waiting for, I don't know why Siri doesn't have a standalone device. And really when you use a, a Google Home versus a, a Amazon Alexa, very different devices, really different kind of targets. So I thought that was an interesting announcement that also came out. But fundamentally it's just, it's fun to see the support of, of IoT and 5G and really enable this next kind of great wave of, of uh, of distribution, disruption, and, and opportunity. We're going to have Sargalai in the studio later today and tomorrow as a guest analyst for us on theCUBE. Of course, for folks who, don't, who may know Sar from being on theCUBE, he was recently a senior vice president reporter to Meg Whitman and built out that uh, telco service provider NFV business model for HP. And he's been to Mobile World Congress almost every year. He didn't make it this year, he'll be coming in studio. And he told me prior to me um, extremely vetting him for theCUBE, if you will, uh, to use a, a Trump term, um, uh, after extreme vetting of Sargalai, I said to him, he, he really wants to make the point of, 
and this is going to be critical analysis and kind of put it, poking a hole into the hype, which is he doesn't think that the technology is ready for prime time, and specifically he's going to comment around he doesn't believe that the apps are ready for all this bandwidth, and he doesn't think, he thinks that 5G is a solution looking for a problem. And I don't necessarily agree with him, so we have a nice commentary. So we'll look for uh, Sar today uh, on the Cube at, uh, at the 11:30. He's coming on, so we're gonna. It's gonna be a little bit of cage match there with Sar. So um, <laughs> well, I, always, I always go back to the Amara's Law, which again I think is the, the most underrepresented and, and most impactful law, which is probably in the short term in the hype cycle, 5G is probably not going to deliver on on the promise up to the level of the hype. But the, as we find over and over with yeah. these funny things like Bluetooth, who would ever like Bluetooth would be such an integral part of so many things that we do today. I think over the long term, the midterm, I think the opportunity is giant. I mean, I think for people to understand 5G, at least the way I was describing it over the weekend when I was at my uh, at lacrosse games and soccer games over the weekend, is for folks that aren't in tech, 5G is the holy grail for IoT, mobile uh, cars and AI because what 5G does, it creates that 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 mesh of RF or RF radio frequency at a whole other level. You look at the radios that Intel was announcing across their telco partners and what Intel's doing really is a game changer. And we all know LTE, when the signal's low on the phone, everyone freaks out. We all know when Wi-Fi doesn't work, you, the world kind of comes to a crawl. I mean, just think 15 years ago, Wi-Fi wasn't even around. Or it, so, so now think about the impact of just what we rely on with the digital plumbing called wireless. Right, right. And you think about the impact of going around the fiber to the home and the cost it takes to bring fiber uh, to the Lincomp was comp uh, commenting on that. So having this, this massively scalable bandwidth that's a radio frequency uh, wireless right. is just a game changer. And if you can do low latency, 10, 20 gig, that's all you need. Then you're going to start to see the phones change and the apps change. And uh, as Peter Burr said, a turbulent change of value propositions will emerge. Yeah, it's funny at RSA a couple weeks back that the chatter was, you know, the people at RSA, they don't use Wi-Fi. You know, they rely on, on secure mobile networks. And so 5G is going to enable that even more. And as you said, if you can get that fat bandwidth to your phone, uh, in a safer and secure, more trusted way, you know, what is the impacts on Wi-Fi and, and what we've come to expect, you know, on our devices and the responsiveness. Now, all that said, there will be new devices, there will be new capabilities, and uh, I guess the other thing is kind of funny is that, of course, the Oscars made their way up on the on the board. <laughs> I thought that might wipe everything out after last night, but um, but no, IoT and 5G is still above Oscars on the trending hashtag. Well, I mean, right? Oscars brings up, you know, it's funny, I mean, we all watch the Oscars, the snafu, I think it was still game, there was some sort of ploy, but. Again, <laughs> you bring up entertainment with the Oscars, you look at what Hollywood's going through, and the Hollywood Reporter had an article talking about Reed Hastings with Netflix, he talked today, I talking about 4K and really kind of higher end you know, video. So the entertainment business uh, is shifting. The cord cutting is happening. We're seeing more and more what they call over the top, and this is the opportunity for the service providers, but also for the entertainment industry. And with social media and with all these new form factors changing, the role of media will be a packet data game. And, and how, how much can you fit in there? Whether it's eSports to fil feature filmmaking, the game is certainly changing. And again, I think Mobile World Congress is changing so radically, it's not just a device show anymore. It's not about the handset. It's about what the enablement is. And I think that's why the 5G impact is interesting. And then making it all work together because a car talking to this device it's complicated, so there's got to be the glue, there's all kinds of new opportunities, and that's what I'm intrigued by, the Intel Qualcomm situation, where you got two chip guys battling it out for who's going to be that glue layer under the hood. Right, and does a lot of the, if you look at some of the quotes coming out of the show too, a lot of the, the kind of high level threads, you got to get away from the components and get into the systems and solutions, which we hear about over and over and over again. It's always about systems and solutions. I think they will find a, a problem to solve with the 5G. I think it's out there, um, but it is, you know, you look, have to get away with the kill components. Me with that, it's kill it's me an with ecosystem My play, philosophy, right? Jeff, is kill me with the bandwidth problem. Give me more bandwidth, yeah, me more. I will consume <laughs> more bandwidth. I mean, look at compute power as, as an example. People thought Moore's law was going to cap out you know, a decade ago. You look at the compute power and the chips and the, with the cloud, with Amazon and the cloud providers, it's almost infinite compute, so then the role of data comes in. So now you got data, now you got mobile. So I think, give us more bandwidth. I think the apps have no problem 
leveling up. Sucking it up. And well, that's going to be the debate with Sarga Live. So <laughs> like we'll the old see what chip, he has to right? Say. Is the old chip, the Intel Microsoft thing, where you know Microsoft or Intel would come out with a faster chip than the OS. We did eat up more of it as part of the OS, and it kept going and going. But I think you know we talked to a lot of VCs, John, and if you're trying to predict the future and build things for the future, you really have to plan now for almost infinite bandwidth for free infinite storage for free, infinite compute for free. And while those curves are you know, kind of asymptotically approaching free, they're not there yet, that is really the world in which we're heading. And how do you reshape the way you design apps, experiences, interfaces, without those uh, constraints, which before were so, so significant? I'm just doing a little crowd chat here. Go to crowdchat.net slash MWC if you want to leave news links or check in with uh, the folks chatting. Uh, and I'm just talking to SAP, and SAP had the big Apple news. And one of the things that's interesting, and Peter Burris talked about this on our opening this morning, is that confluence between the consumer business and then the infrastructure's happening. And that is was called DevOps, but now you're starting to see the developers really focusing on the, the business value of technology. But yet it's not all developers, even though people are saying, oh, the developers are the new king makers. Well, I would say that, but the business model still is driven by the apps, and, and I think developers are certainly closer to the front lines, but I think you're going to start to see a much more tighter coupling between the C-level um, uh, folks in business and the developers. It's not just going to be a developer-led 100% uh, direction. So whether it's entertainment, role of data, that's going to be pretty interesting, Jeff. So Apple's just about finished building the new spaceship headquarters, right? I think it opens up <laughs> next month. I'm just curious to get your take, John, on Apple. I mean, obviously the iPhone changed the game yeah. 10 years ago. What's the next big card that yeah. Apple's going to play? Because they seem to have you know, kind of settled down. You know, you, they're not in, at the top of the headlines yeah. anymore. Well, from my sources at Apple, uh, there are many, and you know, deep inside at the highest levels. What I'm hearing is the following. Obviously, they're doing extremely well financially. Look at the retail, look at the, the breadth of business. I think Tim Cook has done an amazing job. And to all my peers and pundits who are trashing Apple, they just really don't know what they're talking about. Apple's dominating at many levels. They're dominating, firstly, on the fiscal performance of the company. Their you know, digital uh, presence in terms of their stickiness is, is second to none. Um, however, Apple does have to stay on their game because you look at Huawei and all the phone guys, they are in essence copying Apple. So I think Apple is going to be very, very fine. I think where they could really double down and win on is what they did by getting out of the car business. I think that was super smart. Uh, there, was a, there was a post by Autoblog this weekend saying Silicon Valley failed. I completely disagree with that statement, although in the short term it looks like on the scoreboard they're kind of tapping out, although Tesla is here, as well as a bunch of other companies. But it's not about making the car anymore. It's all about the car's role in a bigger eco digital ecosystem. So to me, I think Apple is poised beautifully to use their financial muscle to either buy car companies or deal with the digital aspect of it and bring that lifestyle to the uh, car, where the digital services for the personal personalization of the user will be the sticking point for the transportation. So I think Apple's poised beautifully for that. They have some issues, certainly every company does, but compared to everyone else, I just see no, no one even close to Apple uh, at the financial level, just with the cash, and then just what they're doing with the tech. So from a digital perspective, now Google's got the self-driving cars, Facebook's a threat, Amazon, so those are the big ones I see. Now the other thing that's happening this week is the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco at Moscone. So, you know, again, huge consumers of bandwidth, huge consumers of compute power, not so much storage. I mean, I haven't heard much kind of of the confluence of, of the 5G movement with the Game Developer Conference, but clearly that's going to have a huge yeah. impact as most gaming is probably going to move to more and more mobile platform, less desktop. Well, the Game Developer Conference, the one that's going on the GDC, is kind of, um, has a different vibe right now. You, it's losing, it's, it's, it's a little bit lackluster in my mind. It's classic uh, conference, it's very monetized. The event uh, it seems to be over monetized. It's all about making money rather than promoting community. The community in gaming is shifting. So if you look at like how that show is run versus say E3 and now you got TwitchCon and then Mobile World Congress, one of the big voids is there's no eSports conversation. That certainly will be the big thing. To me, everything that's going digital around gaming is a home run. I think gaming, it's going to shift in a huge way from what we know as today's console, cult. It's going to go completely mainstream in all aspects of the devices. As 5G overlays on top of the networks with the software, gaming will be the first pop. You're going to see esports go nuclear, TwitchCon, those kinds of Twitch 
uh, uh, genre is going to expand. Certainly, the cube will have in the future a gaming cube. So there'll be a cube, you know, anchor desk for uh, most of the gaming culture. Certainly, younger hosts are going to come on. Uh, we're going to be planning on that. But to me, I think the gaming thing is going to be much more lifestyle less culty. Right, right. I think the game developer conference it's it's lost its edge. Right. Well, what are the and one of the other things that comes is obviously Samsung made a huge push. They're advertising crazy last night on the Oscars with the the Casey Neistat ad about, you know, the people are creating movies. Um, and they've had their VR product out for a while, but yeah. there's a lot of uh, social activity saying, what is going to be the killer app that kind of breaks through VR? We know Oculus has had some issues. You know, what do you, what do you kind of read in between the tea leaves there, John? Well, it's interesting, the Oscars was awesome last night. I always love to watch the Hollywood spectacle, but one of the things that I liked was that segment where they introduced the technical Oscars, and they kind of were tongue in cheek because no one in Hollywood really has any clue, and they were pandering, well, we didn't even know what they meant, but it was really the alpha geeks who were pioneering what used to be the green screen technology, now you go on CGI, it's our world. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I want to see that, more of that, because that is going to be the future Hollywood. The tools and the technologies for filmmaking is going to have, have a Moore's Law-like impact. It's the same I was mentioning about eSports. You're going to see all kinds of new creative. You're going to see all kinds of new tech. They talked about these new cameras. I'm like, do a whole show on that, and we'd love it. But what it's going to enable is you're going to see CGI come down to the price point where um, what we look at PowerPoints and Adobe Creative Suite and these tools, you're going to start to see some badass uh, creative come down for CGI. And this is where the artist aspect comes in. I think art design will be a killer field. I think that is going to be the future of filmmaking. I think you're going to see an indie market explode in terms of talent. The new voices are going to emerge. The whole diversity thing is going to go away because now you're going to have a complete disruption of Hollywood where Hollywood owns it all. You know, that's going to get flattened down. I think you're going to see a massive democratization of filmmaking. That's yeah. my take. And then, of course, we just continue to watch the big players, right? The big players are in here. It's the, it's the startups that provide the spice, but I'm looking here at, at the Ford SAP announcement uh, that came across the wire. We know Ford's coming in at scale as, you know, GM has done a lot of stuff with IBM as well. So... Um, you know, those people bring massive scale and scale, as we know, drives pricing. And I think when people like to cap on Moore's Law, they're so uh, focused on the physical. I think the power of Moore's Law has nothing to do with the microprocessor per se. It did early days, but really it's an attitude, which we talked about a little bit briefly about what does the world look like if you have infinite networking, infinite compute, and infinite storage at basically free. And if you start to think that way, that changes your perspective on everything. All right, Jeff, well, thanks for the commentary. Great uh, great segment, really breaking down the impact of Mobile World Congress. Again, this show is morphing from a device show, phone show, to a full-on end-to-end network. Companies like Intel are leading the way, and the entire ecosystem of industry partners are going to write software for this whole new app craze, Mobile World, and of course. We'll be covering it here all day today, Monday the 27th, and all day the 28th. Stay tuned, stay watching. We've got more guests coming right back with more after this short break. Oh.